Hello. I would like to welcome our viewers today to a series of studies on the subject of eschatology. Some of you may ask, what is eschatology? Eschatology, simply put, is a biblical study of the end times. Webster's Dictionary defines it this way. It is the doctrine of the last or final things as death, judgment, and the destination of the soul. Some of the topics that will be discussed in this series includes looking at the Word of God as being three-dimensional. We will be studying about God's timetable in the Scripture and where we are at now in this time. We will also be studying Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness, first as the church, then as the human body, God's third and final temple. Our featured speaker today is Brother Cecil J. Ducio. He was born and raised on the island of Jamaica, and his story of salvation is a most incredulous one, but true. As a young man, he was very wild in nature, and he came to a point in his life that he became very despondent and ready to take his own life. But God intervened and saved him. After his conversion, he began to pour over the scriptures and he came to a most remarkable conclusion. He saw that God spoke to many men and women in the Bible, both good and evil. And so he said to God, if you could speak to these people, then you could speak to me. So he asked God to meet him the next day at 4 p.m. The following day, when he returned home from work, Jesus was there to meet him. And from that point on, for the next seven months, Jesus spoke to him and instructed him in the word of God. From that time on, both he and his wife, Mavis Ducille, have labored in the gospel for over 50 years first in their home country of Jamaica, then in the United States, and ultimately to almost every corner on the face of the earth. He is the author of a number of books, most notably The Pattern, which is an in-depth study into Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. His most recent work includes a three-volume set of an in-depth commentary on the book of Revelation. Please join with me as we begin our studies in eschatology with Brother Cecil J. Ducille. Let us begin the 11th session with continuation from the 10th. We were talking about being in Christ and what the meaning of being in Christ is um, being baptized into Christ. And, uh, you know, when the priest takes the meat, uh, of course, it's now meat, but it was a bull just recently, and he takes it into the holy place. He takes it through the door of the holy place. He comes through here, comes through here, and he sits here, and he changes the bread that was there before, the stale bread. He puts on fresh bread out of his basket. And they sit around this table and they begin to eat the meat and the bread. They, in essence, what that means is that we get into Christ as the high priest. And the high priest takes us in. Amen. And we no longer have our own free wills. We no longer have our own desires to do our thing. But we have given over our will and our desires into the high priest. And we cannot go anymore as we would. But wherever the high priest go, we go. In other words, we become the energy of the high priest. Because we get now, we are in him and he in us. And as, as the scriptures describe it in, um, in, in John 
chapter 17 when Jesus Christ was praying for the brethren <clears throat> he said in verse 23 I in them I in them that's Jesus Christ getting into us we open the door of our hearts <clears throat> and he gets into us and thou in me remember Jesus Christ coming into the brother the sister but when he comes in instead of getting Jesus Christ alone you get Jesus and the Father you get the Godhead because you have the Holy Ghost already you get the fullness of the Godhead inside of you and then I in them thou in me that they may be made perfect in what? That's the only way that the church will become one when Christ is in us and we are in Christ. That thou hast, that, and the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So then there is a union that is consummated when we go into the body of Christ and we look forward to the day when we will have no denominations but just the body of Christ and as the body of Christ we would have freedom in moving in Christ for right now if the Spirit of God touches you and give you a message to go down to a church down the street you walk into that church you have no authority there the pastor has to give you the authority to go up on that platform otherwise you are unceremoniously taken down hallelujah now we therefore see what it is to be in the body of Christ now we go then let us look at the tabernacle through the door the scripture says I am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be saved now <clears throat> if you go through Jesus then you're going to come to the candlestick operation now what is the candlestick operation we see that this God said to Moses make me a candle a, a, a lampstand I am continuously saying candlestick and I want you to correct me in your minds lampstand make me a lampstand with seven lamps seven lamps at the top of it and it must be one beaten piece of metal no molding you're not going to cast it you're not going to pour it or anything else you're going to have one piece of metal and I, I, I figure it I sit down wonder how they would do that one sheet of metal fold it in two put the, can, the menorah inside of it and beat it beat it until it beats around and beats and get the shape and get the flowers and everything and then I take out the thing I'm beating and, and then I put the joints together and beat it and cut it like this you know I sit down and see how we could make that in our minds but then the candlestick or the lampstand is a symbol first of all it is made of gold and gold is the nature of Christ in other words the metal gold is the nature of Christ I'll take this off and I'll put these few thoughts here gold Gold equals the divine nature. Good. 
Now, the next thing it has is a uh, um, oil. Oil. Holy Spirit. And then it has a wick. And that is humanity. You see that God will not do anything unless he does it through humanity, his ministry. So we find that the, the lampstand is a type of God's nature working with the Holy Spirit through a man, through a human being. God and man working together for what purpose? To bring light. It was the only light in the tabernacle. So God and man worked together to produce that light. The light of the body comes through humanity. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. And then he turned around and said to the brethren, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. If you are working with sinners, hmm, working with sinners, <laughs> make sure first day you go in, you announce yourself as a Christian. And you draw all the fire. And that's the only way you're going to escape from compromising with them. Just blaze out. Let them know you're a Christian. You serve God. Praise God. <laughs> you know, amen. Hallelujah. That's the only way you will be able to escape from compromising because they will want you to cuss as they cuss. They'll want you to, to do certain things as they do it. When they know you're a Christian, they won't even curse before you. But if you don't tell them and you keep very quiet about it, the next thing happen, you will find that you are cursing just like them or behaving just like them. And that you will lose your testimony right in the middle there. Because God works through humanity. The light of God can only come to the world through human agents. This is what God plans to do. He didn't plan to send down a bunch of angels out the street handing out tracts. He wants you to do it. And whatever he tells you to do, you should do. Amen. You should not have a, a, a pastor on our organization to stop you. How dare you go hand out tracks without telling us? We didn't, you know. You must function under God. Hallelujah. And so that's the candlestick. The next one we have there, we turn to the right. The priest comes through the door. He turns to the left. He lights the lamp. He trims the wick. He turns to the right. And he sits at the table to eat the bread. Now, that table is made out of gold, the nature of God, divine nature. But it's made out of wood. Wood. The base of the table is wood. And it is a special wood, either acacia wood or gopher wood. It's the same as something more like oak. Um... And that means humanity. So therefore, we have something else that means humanity. Wood means humanity. And the wick is humanity. You see, the wick is the one that is expendable. The gold doesn't burn. But the oil burns. The oil burns through the wick. And so the, the, the wick will um, burn out. And they have to put new wick in it. And, and so wood, this one is made of wood. 
This table is a wooden table covered with gold. Now, if you go in there and you see it, it's a golden table. You cannot see the wood. That means God is saying when you get to this point in God, your carnality does not show. Amen. Your carnal man does not show. Everything that shows is a spiritual man. In preaching the word, your carnality should not show. Your manliness should not show. Or your womanliness should not show. All should show is the divine nature of God. Then on this table, you have the bread. Now, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the manna that is come down from heaven. But then on the table are 12 loaves. So why 12 loaves? Because if Jesus Christ is bread, we are also bread. If Jesus Christ came down to feed the world with himself, so should we. So at that table, God is talking about the whole body of Christ or Israel. 12 tribes of Israel represented by 12 loaves of bread. And we are that bread. And somebody says, I know um, a brother was very indignant to hear us say that we are Israel. <laughs> very indignant. Amen. How dare you? What do you know about Israel? Because he was a Jew. Well, it so happened that Israel is not Israel because they were natural seeds of Abraham. But the spiritual seed of Abraham is what God said would be as the stars of the sky, numberless. So are we. The seed of Abraham, the natural seed of Abraham, Israel, son of God. That's what we are. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have become Israel. And, and as you can read uh, in Paul's dissertation, uh, under the power of the Spirit in Romans, when he speaks about the, the, the natural branch, amen, being cut off and engrafted into the tree were these other branches. And that one day God is going to engraft back again the Israel into its rightful place. You see, but Israel must first see Jesus. Amen. The Israel must first see Jesus. In other words, everyone who sees Jesus will become one of his, a son of God, like a Christian. And those who don't see Jesus, the only way they can become part of this Israel of God is to be quickened, awakened, born again, see Jesus. So you see, God has ordained to have one church. And he says, out of many, out of two, or as the scripture says, out of twain, he'll make one new man out of two Jews and Gentiles. God's going to have one church. And it will be neither Jew nor Gentile church. It will be the body of Christ. So here we are. The wood represents humanity. Now, you will notice then that this is a church and it is a work of grace. And this work of grace must be done in the human being. This, you as a human being, you must have the living bread to feed the nation. But you must also be covered with gold before you are fit to feed. There is no rawness that should show your skin should be too thick to be broken to show flesh. God Almighty wants you to know that. That's the symbol of that um, eating of the 12 loaves of bread on the table. And then 
he leaves, the priest would leave here and he would come to the golden altar. Now here again the golden altar is made of wood, same wood, special wood. And in other words, when you repent of your sins, you become gopher wood, acacia wood. And God says he's going to add gold to you. And he begins to plaster you with gold so that you are gold plastered. And you're not what you really look like because you're supposed to look like Christ. <laughs> and the gold outside makes you look divine makes you look good, make you look wonderful. You know, I've always said to the brothers, don't look at a girl when she is in the spirit or else you might find yourself one day waking up to find her not in the spirit. If you look at a person when they're manifesting in the spirit, they look marvelous. They look wonderful. You say, this, this, this is a wonderful person. You don't know the person. Amen. You saw the spirit. You saw the gold. And so the outside is gold, but the inside is wood. And God says, the wood should never be seen. Never be seen. It should be buried forever under the gold of God's nature. Then this golden altar, a peculiar place, because this golden altar is right before the veil. Right before the veil. Standing right here before man enters into God. The outer court is the Holy Ghost realm, the holy place is Christ's realm, and the holy of holies is the Father realm. So you're going from outside here, driving by the Holy Ghost, inside here, ministered to by Christ, to into God. That's where the holy, the high priest is going to take you into God. Now, just before you get into God, there is a barrier there. And this barrier is called the mercy seat. The, the, uh, sorry, the, the altar of incense. Let me show you something that I did not show you before. Um, one, I'll call, oh, my, I'm running out of board. I'll call one, okay, I'm going to, Rub off that which is on top here so that I can continue to use this and still have that down there. Yes, number one is the brazen altar. And it means salvation. Number two is the brazen laver. Baptism, sanctification, consecration. Number three is the lampstand number three is the lampstand, and it means um, working with Christ that yeah. um, I seem to have rubbed out that one. Working with Christ. 
Number four is the table of showbread. And that is feeding. Feeding on Christ. Number five is the golden altar of incense. Now, the meaning of that is offering, OFF, offering of the soul. Now, the scriptures tell us, present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable. Where is that? Here. That's all you had. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice here. But when you get here, he's asking you for another sacrifice. If you notice, there are only two sacrifices in the tabernacle. The first sacrifice is of the body. The second sacrifice is incense. But this incense is the essence of your soul. God is asking you to offer him your soul. And I am telling you that is death if the offering is not right. At that point in the tabernacle, history shows that all the men who died in the tabernacle, they died at that spot. The first one we saw dying there was Nabab and Abihu. Two of them got there, formed the fool, struck dead. We then we read in the, the, that, that when Joab, when David was dying, he said to Solomon, let not the gray hairs of Joab go to the grave in peace. Because of what Joab did is wickedness. And Solomon was smart enough, wise enough, immediately got the throne. Get Joab. Joab is too powerful to fool around with. Get him right now. And so when the man went after him, Joab ran. And what, where did he go? He held on to the horns of the altar. Now when you hold the horns of the altar, you're asking for mercy. So the man went, saw him holding on to the horns of the altar, didn't know what to do. He turned back to Solomon and said, what should I do? He's holding on to the horns of the altar. Solomon said, kill him right there. You know why? He was at the place of death. At that point in the tabernacle, every man who is disobedient dies. I don't know if you notice how many evangelists die after having an illustrious career of miracles and preaching and they die some very ignominious death um why why did this happen i asked myself a question then i found out that they died like joab died at the place of death in other words whether you live here or you die and your body is carried back out there. You will go through here. You must die at this point. Let me, let me show you what I mean. When the priest reaches here, he has taken up all the sins of the people here. The people lay their hands on him. This one said fornication. The other one said adultery. The other one said theft. The other one said lying. And then they continued. And all the burden of Israel is laid upon him. 
according to the word of God laid upon the lamb. He's in the place of the lamb now. And when this is done, he goes here and he takes the incense and he says, Oh God, I'm offering this incense to you for the sins of your people and for my sins. So he offers for the sins of the people and for his sins and if God does not accept it, they die. If God accepts it, the smoke goes up and they see the smoke going up. Amen. God accepted the, 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 the offering and when God accepts the offering, it is his soul that he offers. And it's a place of trembling. I understand that the priest trembles when he gets there because it could be the last breath that he's taking because he's going to enter into the presence of God. And so the, the, this altar then is made of, it has horns in it. It's made of wood, it's covered with gold and the symbolism of it is the offering of the soul. I, I, I will deal with that in a more extensive way in when we get to the or maybe another two sessions. But um, in this, at this moment, I will just touch on what I'm talking about. When you were born, you were born with certain traits from your family, ancestral tra traits, sins that your forefathers committed that seem to have become a family business, that the, 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 the spirits that reign and rule over your family have come to take you to reign and rule over you also. And um, it becomes a part of your soul. So every soul nature that you have has to be eradicated. The very way that you think, the machinations of your mind and your, 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 your emotions You'll find the same emotions that your grandfather had. You had the same emotion. Anger. You know. And going down, your will, your desires, come right back to the same desires that your fathers had, your mother had. You come, you find yourself with the same desires. God Almighty says, give him up now. I want you to give me your mind. I want you to give me your heart, your soul, your desires, your will, your emotions. How many of us have done that? We're still there. Many of us are still there. Some of us will not face the altar because God is asking you for your temper. Amen. And you feel that your temper is your defense. You want to give it up. And so you, you encourage it. And then when a spirit looks and sees the darkness, he comes and dwells in the darkness. So you have a spirit helping you to carry out your own um, emotional life. God says, give it up at that point. Now, take another dimension. That point represents a point in time. A point when the church will reach to a point that it can't go any further. Even the church that has overcome to this point. It cannot go any further unless it dies. That church must be willing to give up its life. It's, it's, it's you know, what comes to me, beautiful building. Spend so much money, so much time to put up a beautiful building. And you come to a point of time in the history of the world when you have to give up the building, the government or some other forced antichrist come and say, I want it, and you have to give it up. In other words, God is saying that the church is now at the golden altar, and they will die there or they will break through. Amen. 
Now, if this is the case, then the golden altar is a fearful and dreadful place. And the golden altar is a place in the year 2001, where we are now. You have heard me say it before. It was, we were there in 1999. <laughs> we were there in 1998. We were there in 1997. I don't know how long we were there, but we are there. We haven't moved through. We haven't broken through the veil. Because there, when you break through the veil, you are no more human. All the human traits are gone. God is about to break us through the veil. And the scripture said, the veil is his flesh. Now, let me see if I can run through the veil with you. Amen? <laughs> Let's get through the veil. How do you get through the veil? Well, the priest, you notice I'm preaching the two, two dimensions at the same time. The preach, priest takes out his sword and he slits the veil. And he lights the incense. And when the incense goes up before God, he goes through with it. And he puts it in, and it fills the whole house. And when it covers the mercy seat, this one, it covers the mercy seat completely, then he goes in. Hallelujah. And when God is pleased with him, he sees the brightness begin to appear. And it gets brighter and brighter until he can't look at it. And when God really accepts him, he begins to leap in the spirit. And as he leaps, the bells around his phylactery begin to ring. Ding, ding. And that's what we mean by the joy bells. <laughs> and when the people hear the bells ringing, they shout for joy. For God has accepted the prayers of Israel and their sins are forgiven. Amen. So he goes through the veil. Now that is the natural first dimension. What is the spirit view? The scripture says the veil which is his flesh. Speaking of Jesus Christ. There's a veil between spirit and soul. And we have to get there now as soon as we finish, I'm just going to touch that but not going to preach on it. There's a veil between spirit and soul that prevents the spirit from getting into your soul. Amen. And you can open the door and the spirit comes in and lock it again. But the spirit of God intention is to flow into your soul so that you are no longer you. <laughs> no longer you. I look at your face and I think you are you and you are not you. You are Christ. It's just Christ at all. And this is where the Spirit is pressing to break through that veil. When that happens, God said there's a time when that is going to happen. And when it happens, we will break through into the presence of God. Hallelujah. All right. I, I, I tell you what I'll do. I will not go into the, 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 the preaching of this. I leave this. To, to go into the human dimension, which is the last dimension. And, um, of course, there are more and more lessons to preach, but we will try to bring it to that place. Well, we're going to have the questions now, and uh, so we um, will we'll, we'll stop right here and let the questions bring out the, the other things that are lacking and needing right now. Brother Sess, um, we talked about the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies as being uh, different um, dimensions in the spiritual world and, and in the church. And uh, in Revelation 11:2, it says, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, <coughs> shall they tread under foot 40 and two months. My question is, if the outer court 
is an area that is trampled under by the Gentiles, what is the difference between the outer court and outside the outer court? It, 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 the outer court, is the, the scripture there, it didn't say outside the outer court. It said the out, it is the outer court. Read, read it again. It, it says, um, but the court which is without the temple, leave out. That's the outer court. That, yes, the court. That that was the outer court. My question is, uh, outside, of the, outside of the outer court, why, why would there be any difference if the outer court is going to be destroyed? Is there a difference for people that are in the outer court? Are they any different from people that are in the world? Yes, yes. Yes, there's a difference. The people in the world are out here outside of the tabernacle entirely. They are people who will go to hell. They will be in the tribulation and destruction. Or they will take the mark of the beast. Or they will come through here. The outer court is the church. People who are born again. They will perish. They will suffer like these out here. But they will go to heaven. <laughs> In other words, look with me. Many Christians have the same type of cancer and go through the same type of suffering that the sinners are going through. But some are going to hell and some are going to heaven. See, so it, it, that's the difference. Now, the, I did the pressure on the outer court is to wipe out the outer court completely so the church won't have any outer court according to that in Revelation with the intention that they should run into the holy place. They will. All those who really genuinely save and have the word of God, God said he will not forsake them. They will come in. When they come in, they, um, there, there's a destruction that is going to come in here. After God wants to force us through here, he's going to let the Antichrist set up his throne right here. And when the Antichrist set up his throne, we will flee. So we, we see the outer court coming into the holy place, the essence of the outer court coming into the holy place. The essence, that's why you, you have to go in here in spirit. The essence comes into the holy of holies. And, and, and that's, that's what it means. This is going to be destroyed. And the, oh, the, the symbol of it we have is that the first 2,000 years were completely destroyed, but the essence came into the, 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 the third thousand years. Yes, question. Uh, my question is on the table of showbread or the feeding on Christ. Um, you said that when the priest turns to the right there, he goes to the table of showbread and begins to eat the meat and the bread. And that when you reach that point, no flesh should be showing. Yes. Just go. So uh, how is the feeding on Christ, how does that take place uh, so that people can indeed, you know, grow into the nature of God? And I assume that it precludes feeding on certain other things if the you know, the divine nature is to come forth. Well, the feeding on Christ is what you are doing now. So it shouldn't be hard to understand. Those who will feed on the word of God and will, um, you know, go after the spirit. Jesus Christ said to them um, in, in, my, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus said, um, I, verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread 
which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove against themselves, and you know, how this man says we should eat him. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up again at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. So you see, he's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ, that we the life of God, we must take in the life of God, and we should eat the flesh, the natural bread. It, it is the, the, the word of God. You see, he said, I have bread that no man knows of. When the brethren asked him, amen. So, the next question. Uh, Brother Sass, you were talking about um, the um, gold in the tabernacle uh, referencing the divine nature and it brings to my mind uh, in the book of Revelation it talks about the streets of gold and that thing follows and it brings many things to my mind of what is being uh, preached today uh, rapture doctrine pre-tribulation rapture where the church is going to be taken out of the tribulation we're all going to be in the marriage supper of the lamb and everybody that doesn't believe like I do will be suffering in the tribulation. Uh, it seems to me that God intends for man to do more than live and die and go to heaven. That he wants something more of man and that this is a picture of what uh, God desires of man. Why then do those that profess to be the church continually insist that their false doctrine is the truth of God. Uh, well, there's only one little answer for that, and that is carnality. Because the scriptures tell us in Romans 8 that to be carnally minded is death, that to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So there is a carnality among the people that make them look at the word of God and they take it on the lowest level, low um, physical dimension, and they want to operate in the physical dimension. Uh, take, for instance, the one you mentioned, street of gold. There is no such word in the Bible as streets of gold. There is one that the street, and there was a street of gold in the middle of the city. Now, the street of gold is Jesus Christ. Amen. The street of gold is Jesus Christ. This is the street that we walk on. I said, I am the way. I am the street. The truth and the life. You see, they don't realize that it is just translation. The man who wrote it, he said, I am the way. And he was thinking of a street. And you could easily say, I am the street. The truth and the life. The street. The truth. Main street. I mean, the truth and the life. And... Uh, the street of gold, therefore, is one street of gold. And they, the, the church take it and run away with it, and they preach streets of gold. And nobody ever looked it up to say, well, this, this preaching is wrong. It is not streets of gold. It is one street of gold. Amen. Next question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Sass. Um, I see the tabernacle as like a, a process. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to go through the brazen altar, through the brazen laver, go into the holy place, and then come back out to the outer court? Like, be in the holy place one minute, and be in the outer court another minute. Well, what I'm saying and what I'm seeing is that the Holy Ghost does everything possible to push you in there. And people have gone to the point where they see the truth and they turn back from it and say, no, I prefer the, uh, the, uh, there. Now, in the outer court, there's where you get the big crowds. There's where you get a lot of money. There's where you get applauded and lauded. And um, there is where 
you, you become the miracle worker, and so on. And it is very popular, very wonderful to be there as far as the men are concerned, the people of God are concerned. So people don't want to live there. A lot of people don't want to live there. The worst thing you could do with certain people is to take away their powers of healing. <laughs> if you take away their powers of healing, they, they would give anything for it. So um, there is an attraction to be in the outer court. But God is going to make it very unpleasant. Very soon, there's a destruction coming to the outer court church that is without remedy. Without remedy. Because it will be coming from God, although it will be coming from the world, the Gentiles. So, um, look out. And if your big toe is in the outer court, haul it in. Amen. Next question. When you were speaking of the lampstand operation, I couldn't help but think of the uh, parable of the ten virgins. Yes. Is there any correlation there with, with the operation and with the parable? What is it, the difference between having oil in the vessel and not having that oil there? Well, um, the scripture says that the spirit of man is the lamp of God shining in the, in, in the soul, searching through the soul. Now, the spirit of man is the lamp of God. That means that with the five virgins, they had oil in their lamps, they had oil in their vessels. But oil in their lamps ran out. Ten virgins, five of them had oil that ran out of their lamps, and, and they ran out of their vessels. They had nothing in their vessels. So it turned out that at midnight, when the testing came, there was no oil. Oil is Holy Spirit. And it is the oil that brings the light. And I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of Christians losing their light by becoming worldly. Becoming worldly, compromising. Amen. And they will end up out in the darkness with the sinners. That's exactly what it means. Next question. One more. Uh, Brother Sash, you said that um, when the individual comes to the um, golden altar of incense, it represents the offering of the soul. Yes. Uh, improper offering, disqualification, and death. Yes. Um, practically, how would you define uh, what is the proper and the improper offering? What is the thing that would qualify or disqualify a man at that point in his, in his experience? Well, I could offer God my expertise as an accountant and as, um, you know, whatever you are in life, you could offer that to God, and that's like offering a pig upon the altar of God. God doesn't want that. God wants your surrender. And so whatever we offer to God that is not what God requires, it is improper offering. The first offering that we see made by two men, um, Cain and Abel. Cain offered an offering to God. But he offered fruits. Fruit has no blood. God didn't want it. He offered fruits to God. And Abel offered the right sacrifice that God asked for. And you know, you know the rest of the story that he killed him. He, he was a murderer at heart. And so he killed his brother through anger because he offered a better sacrifice than he did. So we can see then how um, the, the, the wrong offering could be anything that is not of God. Like I was saying, someone could go to Bible college, learn psychology, learn how to preach, do great labor work, 
work night and day to labor, to get things in, 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 in order, you know, to serve God. Because they want to serve God with all their heart. But they go to Bible school and to get the knowledge to serve God. And so they start with their knowledge, they start preaching, they start doing all that they can do with all their heart. God does not accept it. He doesn't want your psychology. He doesn't want your knowledge. What he wants is you. That a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. He wants you to come and offer him not the sacrifice of Cain, but the sacrifice of Abel, this is what God requires. In our next session, we will go into the Holy of Holies, and that will lead us right into the next dimension.